Hello. Our story begins on Genosis instead of the chamber where Dooku planned to escape from. He'd been tread across a portion of the battlefield by an LAAT, and a Kenobion were inside of it. And after Skywalker was thrown across the room by electricity, Kenobi lost in a straight fight against his master's master. Before Dooku could kill the Jedi instructor, Anakin leapt across the room and ignited his lightsaber. It was a quick action that saved Kenobi's life. Anakin and Dooku then engaged, their blades bashed together, as Anakin took on one of the most talented duelists of his era. The Countess Sereno could do this all day. It was light work for him. He moved his blade elegantly, while the pace in Anakin's step showed that of an inexperienced warrior attempting to go toe to toe with him. Dooku didn't care for this attempt and simply moved his blade to deflect and parry Skywalker. This fight could be over easily, but there was some joy in drawing Anakin in, making him feel like he could win, and then making him lose with little resistance. Anakin was using two blades initially until the first one was cut from his hand, and then he continued to fight against Dooku with one blade. The two duelists moved back and forth. Anakin even cut the lights out from the building, but that wouldn't do him any good. The natural light in the cave would eventually return, and as Anakin spaced himself out, he left his arm hanging in the open. Dooku had two options here, and he could see the arm attack being a faulty move made by him. He swung his blade under Anakin's, and then it sped through the air, clipping him in the shoulder and then dragging across his eyes and the bridge of his nose. Anakin cried out in agony. He brought his open hand to his face and immediately pulled away, burning the tips of his fingers. All he saw was a blinding whiteness. He pulled his blade back and swung it forward, and Dooku sidestepped him. It could have been very easy to kill Anakin here, but there'd be no need for that. Dooku was enjoying this. As Skywalker tried to come to grips with his reality, the sound of a cane could be heard. Anakin turned himself towards Dooku, which bent his back was facing Yoda. The Grand Master, without hesitating, ignited his lightsaber and jumped to Anakin's side. Yoda had no clue that Anakin was blinded. He just saw that Obi-Wan was injured and he knew that at this point Skywalker would be no match for Dooku's skills with the blade. Dooku liked his odds. He'd been yearning for the chance to finally defeat his master. As Yoda and Dooku engaged, Anakin allowed the sound of the duel to lead him into combat. Due to his lack of vision, Skywalker started swinging his blade around, which for Dooku was truthfully tantalizing. How could he defend himself from something that wasn't a true form? Anakin was literally swinging his weapon like a bat. He didn't care what was in his way, he just kept on moving, using his other senses to feel where the Countess Sereno was. It was at this point that Yoda realized the extent of Skywalker's injuries. Yoda was now playing by Anakin's rules. He could not interfere but defend himself and Anakin. It worked to perfection too. Dooku was completely put off by the lack of formation or strategy used by the Jedi, and it forced him into an awkward position. He initially favored himself over Yoda, but it was becoming clear that that wasn't a choice for him. The three duelists continued, and then the clone troopers arrived, setting their weapons for stun and blasting away at Dooku. It took a couple of shots, but Anakin's psychotic break, Yoda's mastery, and the lack of escape broke Dooku to his knees, to only be captured by beings he essentially ordered to be created. Dooku was locked up once he was incapacitated, and Yoda finally got Anakin to simmer down. When Padme came in, he was just confused, and despite a very open hug, the Jedi wouldn't think anything of it. The next 24 hours of Anakin's life would be very confusing and difficult to deal with. One of Anakin's primary senses had been stolen from him. He couldn't go back in time and fix it. He had 19 years of vision, and now, with the swing of a lightsaber, there was nothing. Anakin was eager to start a relationship with Padme, become a Jedi Knight, and finally had the freedom of a true Jedi, but at what cost? By the time Skywalker returned to Coruscant, he was too depressed to see Padme back to Naboo, and expressed desires to break things off with her for the time being. He still loved her for her, but he just couldn't. He felt like the air had been taken out of him. The shock of this permanent change hadn't even registered, and despite how warm Padme made him feel, he shut down. Anakin locked himself away inside the Jedi Temple, and stopped eating. He didn't speak to anyone for days, only getting enough water to stay alive, essentially. Anakin's door was knocked on a number of times by Obi-Wan, but each attempt was pushed away by him. Skywalker didn't want to say anything to anyone, and the more alone he stayed, the further into his state of mind he fell. It was scary. Anakin had fears of the dark as a child, seeing a metallic masked creature form in the shadows across alleyways and in his mother's kitchen. As an adult, he tried to act like it didn't frighten him, but nothing was scarier than nothingness. Using the Force could gift him some vision of the world around him, and he did use that Force to get from one side of the room to the other, but most of the time he was just staring at the ceiling, remembering everything he could see before his sight was taken. Anakin continuously struggled. He just couldn't move on. He locked onto that final moment of vision, how badly he messed up in that moment, how he should have listened to Obi-Wan before they fought Dooku, or any number of things that could have prevented it from happening. Sure, he had a lust for revenge against Dooku, but he was useless. 
If he couldn't defeat Dooku with his sight, how could he do it as a blind man? The answer was simple, he couldn't, though that probably wouldn't be an issue, considering Dooku was locked away in a maximum security prison as it was. The war, thankfully, had come to a complete stop. Sidious was trying to prop up figureheads, but no one in the Separatist movement had enough of a backbone to do it alone. With Dooku captured, Jango dead, and the Battle of Genosis a decisive loss, Wat Tambor and the Techno Union dropped out of the CIS. The more time it took for Sidious to conjure up new leaders, the likelihood of losing more corporations increased. He was working overtime to undo the errors of Dooku. Not to mention, Sidious was also trying to get Dooku out of prison. The entire situation was a mess for him, and all the systems that rallied behind Dooku quickly found the situation to be unsustainable, and subsequently, they backed out of the war effort. The clone army worked too well. It scared the Separatists into submission, because despite the effectiveness and size of the droid armies, the fact that the Republic could whip together a fleet and military so fast was troublesome to say the least for Separatist leaders. While the galaxy course corrected, and Sidious went into high panic mode, Anakin finally left his room. It was a week after he lost his sight on Genosis. He walked to the door and when it opened, he felt the breeze of the hallway sting his face. It was cool and warm at the same time. The air in his room was stiff and stale, especially since he didn't open his windows in the entire time he was in there. Skywalker felt the presence of someone familiar, and it was Obi-Wan. Anakin asked his instructor what he was doing here, and he simply responded telling Anakin that he was waiting for him. He wanted to make sure he was alright, but he clearly wasn't. Anakin was wearing loose clothes but not eating for an entire week made those clothes slip around like an oversized sweatshirt. Kenobi told Anakin to come with him and they would talk. Anakin was hesitant to, and so he reached out his arm. Obi-Wan, without a second of hesitation, took Anakin's hand and guided him forward. They spoke about what was going on and Anakin quietly listened. Kenobi was filling Anakin in on the details and suggesting that his actions on Genosis saved the Republic from an all-out war. It was true though. Anakin swinging his blade around like a glow stick at a rave really helped Yoda secure his victory over Dooku. If Anakin hadn't lost his sight, he would have been ecstatic with the response to their win, but he was emotionless. There wasn't a smile, a wink of happiness, a show of teeth or anything, just a simple murmur that slipped under his breath, not even distinguishable to Obi-Wan. When they ate together, there still wasn't much to be said. Due to Anakin's eating habits as an active young man, he ate a lot before he was blinded. He was only able to consume a quarter of his portions now. Kenobi felt his heart slowly break the more time he spent around his student. He wanted to help Anakin, but the reality is, the only one that could actually help him was him. Anakin's loss was certainly a difficult one to conquer, but if he let himself suffer alone, then he would surrender himself to a depressive state of mind. Obon told Anakin that if he wanted to, the two of them could go to the garden tomorrow, and Skywalker piped out, his voice echoing across the cafeteria of the temple. He rhetorically asked his master if it was so that they could look at the beautiful tree together. Anakin stood up and twisted his leg over the side of the table and slipped, slamming his head down onto another seat before getting up shakily and running off. Obi-Wan tried to help, but he was shooed away like a bug. Obi-Wan's heart broke for his former student, and he only wanted to help, but he couldn't help someone that wasn't willing to accept it. Skywalker regurgitated his food once he got back to his room, and he went back to lying in his bed. He didn't put music nor white noise on, he simply existed in a void or a vacuum of silence and darkness. There'd be moments when he felt like he could get up, and try and do something, but every time he started to move, his head fought back. Headaches soared and his body crumbled. He locked his door and Obi-Wan couldn't even get in. He could force his way in, but what good would that do? Anakin would spend an entire another week coming to terms with everything. He obviously lost his sight, but his mother too, not to mention the fact that he hadn't spoken to Padme since they returned from Genosis. He was a product of desolation, and he was lost in his own head. For someone like Anakin, this of course was very uncharacteristic. He wanted to be the best, and he wanted to be unstoppable and admired and so much more, but he wasn't chasing those. He was just silent. Kenobi did bring this matter to the council, and while the Jedi wanted to support Anakin, they mutually agreed that they couldn't support him if he didn't want to support himself. They could stay by his side, they could be his guide, but they couldn't do it for him. He had to be the one strong enough to push himself off his bed. He needed to be courageous enough to face his biggest challenge. He needed to have determination to overcome this pain. The council would be by his side, but they wouldn't do it for him. If they did it for him, then he wouldn't ever be able to come to terms with his situation on his own. They understood this would be difficult for Kenobi, but the most they would recommend for him is that he be a friend and a mentor to Anakin. Anakin spent two full weeks inside of his room wasting away, and finally he found the strength to leave. He had some parcels of food from friends dropping off gifts in front of the room. He didn't know they were there until he stumbled into them, but he did eat them. 
Anakin was struggling with the whole no sight thing, but he was beginning to allow the Force to be a beacon of light for him. With blindness and the Force, it was limited to how willing the individual was to commit to their new lifestyle. For Anakin, he was using memories of the temple to guide him, and alongside that, he was able to feel the presence of other Jedi around him. Other than that, he was mostly just a ghost moving about the temple. He took his time and eventually found the exterior of the temple. Due to his isolation, his lack of sight, and therefore his lack of time, he had no clue what time it was. As it turns out, it was the middle of the night. He walked to where he thought the edge of the temple was and sat down, using his hands to scoot forward towards the edge and then he let his legs swing down below him. It was like floating. He could hear the Coruscant skyline buzzing with activity, which led him to believing it was daytime. But the breeze that sped between the temple's pillars were enough to convince him otherwise. His legs dangled and his eyes looked out across the sea of darkness. But in his mind's eye, he could see the surreal beauty he had seen a number of times before. Maybe for the first time in his entire life, he actually felt a bit of peace. It wasn't something that he could just really put a finger on. It felt like home, not that he would have ever wished for this or blindness, but he found comfort in the dissonance. He felt free, not in the way that would let him slip from the side of the temple, but he let go. He let go of what was, and when he trusted the Force to see what was ahead of him, he finally understood, or at least he thought he did. The Force was a tool for him, a gift to him, one that many around the galaxy couldn't use the way he could. If he let something so remarkable slip through the cracks, then he would be a lost soul amongst the stars. The Force was a gift, just like any other, and if he refused to let it help him, then he was refusing to help himself. Skywalker could see clearer than maybe ever before, but the rise of hope was met with the decline of reality. Anakin pictured himself in a future scenario, one where he was a Jedi Master of the Force and of his life. One where he was holding up a light to the Order, in a galaxy where the Jedi had chased the darkness away. He pictured himself wearing not golden but glowing robes, and on his face a cover, one that became synonymous with who he became. Skywalker was no longer invisible. He was a force of light, a gift to the galaxy, because he allowed himself to become something more. Each time he built himself up to this, he was brought back down. The physical turmoil of his suffering materialized within him. Skywalker pulled his legs over the top of the edge and felt for a pillar and leaned his back against it, laying his legs out in front of him. On his belt, he pulled his lightsaber and cut a piece of cloth off his robes, and then pulled it up to his head. He spoke softly to himself and told the Anakin Skywalker he wanted to be, but there was no turning back now. The scariest part of this new endeavor was the fact that he wouldn't just automatically become that person that he wanted to be. It was a process, and it was never an easy one. Every gift he had was given to him on a silver platter, and for the first time in his life he had to work extra hard to take advantage of the gifts he had been given by the Force. Skywalker pulled the cloth around his eyes and gently tied it around his head so that it was a snug fit. His heart rate felt at peace. His breathing was natural, and on his face, a small smile formed. This was the beginning of his own change. Outside of Anakin's own struggles, the galaxy continued to lead towards a war. This was entirely done on Palpatine's own plans. However, no matter how he framed his words, the Senate was catching on. Because Padme was no longer distracted with a few day long fling, she was able to focus on the politics of the galaxy. Palpatine obviously was playing the long game here, but no one rose to the pedestal for the Separatists. The only individual who took a stand for them was Grievous, but he wasn't something that could be controlled. At least with Dooku, Grievous would listen. But he wouldn't just listen to Sidious. They'd interacted once or twice, but Dooku had the real leash around Grievous' neck. There was also a number of failed attempts to break Dooku out. The Council elected to keep him under maximum security. After the first attack, which killed a Jedi Temple guard and injured a few others, the Council moved Dooku to the Jedi Temple to make sure he was kept extra secure. This was supported by the Senate entirely. The war was at a standstill until General Grievous broke through the grip of Palpatine. He took control over the Separatist Council and CIS government. Most of the senators and even counselors disagreed with this notion. It fractured an already weak system into multiple pieces, many of them retreating back into the control of the Republic. A normal chancellor would have been ecstatic with this news, but Palpatine was furious. Also, how could that numpty Dooku lose to a blinded Anakin? It was seriously preposterous. On the flip side of Palpatine's struggles, he had a couple ideas to make sure he could get rid of the Jedi. After all, the clone army was under his control. He just needed a legitimate reason to throw the Jedi under the cruiser. Back in Anakin's life, he came back to the world with a little bit more motivation, but there is still so much to be done. Despite his incentive to become an enlightened Anakin Skywalker, he was still struggling. His appetite hadn't fully returned. He struggled with his physical exercise due to missing it for a couple weeks and not eating, not to mention his mind was a mess. Instead of clear images in his everyday life, 
His bleak mindset created abstract depictions of the world around him. It was the only way he could actually see where he was going, too. Instead of the temple being filled with light, it was like the power was off. The tree in the garden had no life despite it being in the middle of the season where the tree would thrive. This was partially due to depressive episodes he was fending off, but it was also coming from his consistency to fall back into the comfortable, which for Anakin was seeing everything in the worst way possible. As he returned to the galaxy, he'd have time to talk with Obi-Wan, who would suggest that instead of finding the worst, he search for the best. Seek the positive in any situation. If you can't find it immediately, the answers will eventually reveal themselves. Anakin just need the trust that he would find it. Skywalker therefore began putting himself into a position to succeed. He fought with himself, but friction makes fire. Skywalker had to potentially become a blaze, and he was just igniting that flame. If he gave up now or turned back, then he would never see himself become what he was destined to be. As Anakin did this, he found comfort in the shadows. Instead of speaking, he started listening. Instead of jumping onto something, he waited. What crushed Anakin the most is that once he started listening, he realized how much he was cared for by the other Jedi. Skywalker would go into sessions with Yoda, where he would instruct younglings. Anakin knew all the basics, but he just went there to hear something other than the voices in his head. Yoda from time to time would point to Anakin as a reference. He was an inspiration, having saved the galaxy from war despite his injuries. Sure, it was a bit revisionist, but that was the truth in essence. Obi-Wan and Anakin did have a heart-to-heart -heart once he came back. Kenobi told his former student that while the Jedi weren't supposed to share such feelings, the bond between Mash and Apprentice was incredibly important. Obi-Wan loved Anakin, and there was no doubt about that. He raised him ever since he was a boy, and he couldn't imagine anything happening to him. Skywalker never knew it, but Obi-Wan spent nights sleeping with his head against the wall outside of Anakin's room. He wanted to be as close as he could to him, because he was so worried about him. Anakin, maybe for the first time in his studies as a Jedi, really took in how much he meant to his master, and not just him but the other Jedi in the Order. The two of them were in this together, and no matter the shadow of the day, Kenobi would be there by Anakin's side. It was such a touching moment, and Anakin appreciated it more than anything. He wanted to give Obi-Wan credit for helping him out of this, but Obi-Wan rejected it. The work was all done by Anakin. He may have needed a little push, or an extra bit of motivation, but this was all done from within. Due to Anakin's recovery and how he managed to make a sound return to a semi-regular lifestyle, he was ready for when the war actually returned. The galaxy was on edge for months. During this time, Anakin would learn how to be a blind Jedi, but also would learn to understand that the tension in the galaxy had grown. It all boiled up to a point when the Chancellor was killed in an explosion. The CIS government and Separatist Council disavowed General Grievous, which he was perfectly fine with. He would win this war on his own. His plans involved striking at the heart of the Republic, which is what he did. Using maintenance droids, he bombed Palpatine's office and killed him in the process. It left the Republic without a leader, which sure, was troublesome, but they were flying high. A number of systems had rejoined the Republic. The Separatists were weaker than ever before, and the only legitimate leader for the Separatist cause was in the custody of the Jedi. The death of Palpatine only turned him into a martyr. It did have an effect on Skywalker, but it was more of an inspiration. He would join Obi-Wan as the Republic sent its military after General Grievous. It would turn into a wild bantha chase and end on Iridu, where Grievous accidentally cornered himself between two Republic fleets. The malevolence was never finished, and with Sidious gone, the longevity of the Sith came to an end. The Jedi would never know of that. Dooku wouldn't spill any information, and he would eventually die in prison, thanks to Jedi help. The Separatist movement withered away, but the ideals of it didn't. Thanks to the way the war went, the Republic was able to dismantle the structure that had been set in place to support the corporations of the galaxy. It would take a lot of legislation, but it would eventually get passed. Due to the entire predicament regarding Anakin and the tension of a potential war, Yuda took on Ahsoka as a student, temporarily. The war itself didn't last that long. It was a couple skirmishes between Republic troopers and General Grievous' rebels. But when it did come to an end over Iridu, Skywalker was brought back to the temple where Yoda would pass Ahsoka onto him. The pairing was a match made by the Force, because once it became Master and Apprentice, they became inseparable, as close to siblings as anyone could be. Skywalker would have his own troubles with the loss of Palpatine, because it was also another unnatural death, but he now knew how to properly handle himself. Instead of allowing it to control him, he accepted it. He rejected the darkness and opened himself up to more light. Anakin's time training Ahsoka would be very difficult, but he would enjoy it. Obviously, it was a bit difficult for a blind master to instruct a seeing student, but it made their dynamic tighter. They had to trust each other more than they would have otherwise. Anakin's resilience and dedication to make himself a better Jedi was enlightening to many Jedi, and once Ahsoka finished her training, he was brought into the ranks of the High Council. 
He was very honored, but the Jedi themselves believed they were the ones to be gifted. Anakin was a special Jedi. He had his shortfalls, a lot of which came before he lost his sight, but in his struggles, he appreciated what he had before. Instead of it being what little he possessed, it was what he made of how much he had. Master Anakin Skywalker would consider the prospect of a relationship with Padme again. He did still deeply care about her, and he would go as far to say that he did love her. With a new perspective though, he realized that what they had those few days was nice, but if they rushed it, it may have never lasted. The thought was always appealing to him. He did in his own way crave love and even a potential for a relationship. However, like his master, he found other ways to enjoy those type of feelings. Whether it's through flirting or other methods, it didn't matter. He was content with the life he had. Master Skywalker developed his own philosophies on life, the Force, and the Jedi way. These ideals would be discussed and shared openly with the High Council, many of them being so impressed with what he learned on his own that they believed he should take on an entire class of younglings. He was surprised but also honored, though the Council suggested that he continue to do his own studies with his own work. The only way to expand on it is if he kept on going. They were very proud of him and the Jedi he had become. This of course wasn't to say Anakin lost his personality. He had his fun. From time to time he'd steal Kiari Moody's chair and hide it in the walls of the council chambers, or put Kit Fisto's charcoal toothpaste inside of his pillowcase, or if he was feeling extra feisty, he'd hide Plo Koon's mask in the archives. Not every member of the council appreciated this, specifically not the old heads, Mundi, Rancisis, and Yoda, but they accepted the rambunctious nature of Skywalker. It made their collective better as a whole. Anakin embraced the role he filled within the ranks of the High Council, but his work wasn't finished yet. After Ahsoka became a knight, he would train two more students, the first one being a human male and the second one being a Zagirian female. Once Anakin reached his mid-fifties, he was the Master of the Order, serving under Grand Master Windu. At this point, the Jedi would begin expanding outwards, trying to take new territory and such. At 53, Anakin would do something no one would ever expect. Firstly, he accidentally stumbled upon Darth Maul. At this point, everyone thought the Sith to be dead, and technically they were, but Anakin would ensure the religion came to an end. With his Igerian Padawan by his side, as well as Ahsoka, he'd bring Maul back to the Jedi Temple, and use his philosophies to bring Maul to the light. He wouldn't ever become a Jedi, but he would have his happiness. Skywalker's outpost on Tempest would be the first step for the Jedi into the wider galaxy. The midpoint between the High Republic and what was now dubbed the Gilded Republic was a low for the Jedi and the Republic itself. But now, with expansion into the Outer Rim and soon to be other galaxies, Anakin would see his gift expanding outwards to others. While Skywalker would never see the day, the Jedi Order would grow, and the lineage of his students would be instrumental in building an order that thrived unlike any ever before it. His teachings would inspire generations of students, and the future would be littered with students who aspired to be like the great Jedi Grand Master, Anakin Skywalker. And that, my friends, is our wholesome PP story. Again, special thanks to our patrons Benjamin Wells, Django Fett, Clone, The Big Red Piermark, Galvin Gaming, Tristan Mandalore, Sir William 1767, Darth Revan, Grandaddy Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, We Was Yosemite, Annika Stank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Daguin, Safe Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Galen 66 Mammoth Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Dragon, Ford is Legally Star Wars, Airbus, Rex Wolf, Manthe First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Luke Denwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button, support me otherwise, go check out the Patreon, link is down below. Super cool features on there, like knowing when potential videos might be coming out. Otherwise, let's talk about this video. The concept of having Anakin as a blind Jedi just seemed really interesting to me. Because you have Ram Coda and you have Kanan Jars. I think Kanan Jars is one of the best explained characters in all of Star Wars just because of his, his entire arc throughout Rebels, and I think putting that into Anakin was really interesting. I think Anakin's emotions would probably be a lot more depressive, I think there would be rage in there, and lust for revenge. I felt like having him rise out of this hard state of existence would be much more interesting to follow, instead of him going gung-ho and chasing revenge on Dooku, I think his actions having affected the galaxy would be positive, but how he reacted to himself would be the key to everything coming together. And so. This more or less is a character study of Anakin Skywalker kind of dealing with it. So I hope you all enjoyed, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.